Welcome. You are about to take a journey to a place of the divine love within with Deborah Buffet on the Love by Intuition show. For the next hour, allow her to prepare you in becoming a magnet for a profound love-infused relationship by identifying and focusing on solutions through love. Awaken the light within and let your essence shine. And now, here's Deborah Buffet on Love by Intuition, all part of the Dream Vision 7 radio network. Welcome, everyone. Bonjour, mes amis. And yes, here I am, Deborah Beauvais, founder and owner of the Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. And I'm always saying I'm just thrilled with all our radio host podcasters. They are all here for you. So when you have a, a minute, tune in. You can tune in. Any way you'd like, we're on 45 or 50 podcast platforms, we're syndicated with some other stations, we're in Europe, we're global, and you can ask Alexa as well um, to play Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Uh, Well, we have an exceptional guest, and um, he is T.J. Woodward, and he is a revolutionary recovery expert, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, educator, and addiction treatment specialist who has helped countless people through his simple yet powerful teachings. The creator of the Conscious Recovery Method, a groundbreaking and effective approach to viewing and treating addiction. TJ is also the author of three best-selling books and their respective workbooks, Conscious Recovery, Conscious Being, and Conscious Creation. Uh, We are live, so anyone that would like to call in, Bob is in the house. The number here is 833-220-1200, 833-220-1200. And without further ado, welcome to the show, TJ. Oh, thank you so much, Deborah. I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Yes, thank you, and I'm honored to have you. Um, We were speaking earlier that you've been on Roberta Grimes' Seek Reality show that we uh, stream and air, and um, quite a few times, so people can go there and listen to some of those episodes, and I'm just like, well, it's time to have you on the Love by Intuition show, so thank you for coming on. So let's... um, Let's get right into it. I'd like for you to share a bit about your own journey, uh, and it's extensive as far as the journey at the beginning and all the work that you're doing uh, to help heal the human race. But how did this all get started? Well, thank you. I know before we went on air, we were talking about the past and really like how dark it got, had gotten for me. Um, at many times in my life. And the simple answer to that is I found a way out. I found a way to return to my own essential nature. Uh, I am one of those people who can remember very, very distinctly at a very young age being extremely happy, open, filled with joy, awe, and wonder, and just felt like the luckiest kid alive. And that experience changed for me dramatically in my, somewhere around like six or seven years old. And I built a wall around my heart. I closed down. I made these huge decisions about myself. And so one key um, of my work now is helping people identify what were those moments when we separated from our true nature, when we decided something about ourselves that I call core false beliefs, like I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough. And really, the, the spiritual journey, the awakening process is really about unlearning all those decisions we made with very limited information. Yes. And so when you were six, you made a conscious choice to close yourself off. Was your, the first thing one would ask is, would, was your childhood a tumultuous childhood? Was it a happy one? What brought you to decide that at six? Well, it, you know, I don't know how conscious it was. I do have a conscious memory of it. I mean, I can remember like mm-hmm. it was yesterday that it felt like someone or something was actually covering my heart for me. So I don't know if it was conscious or unconscious. But 
you know, I had a very mixed childhood. I'll say it that way. There was, you know, a lot of love in my home. Um, there was also a lot of um, pain in my home, and the combination of um, watching the news and seeing war and hearing um, people talk mm-hmm. in a derogatory way about people of different races and genders. There was a lot happening in the world that caused me to close my heart. One big thing was, you know, in my house, I quickly realized that what people were saying, what people were doing, and the energy I was experiencing were three different things. So I understand now, um, looking back, that that was a, a moment, whether it was conscious or unconscious, to protect myself. And to some degree it worked, but, you know, the unfortunate part is I also was, uh, quote, unquote, protecting myself from the love and connection that all of us so deeply desire, especially as little people. Right, right. You make a good point because many people uh, decide, just like yourself, that that they're unlovable, that they're this, they're that, and they close themselves off. Um, I think, I always say, I think there's probably 90% of us, of the human race, that feel unworthy. And it can stem from someone that said something, uh, an environment like you're experiencing, uh, and you're noticing. And that's another key point that many of the kids are learning from the parents, the teachers, they're hearing that derogatory language. They're hearing, um, you know, any, anything that is separating us as a group of people, whether it's gender-related, whether it's, um, you know, everyone looks different over there. That It's really separation. But that, do, do you think, TJ, that, I mean, that's why we're here. I mean, we came so that we could grow our souls and experience all these emotions and get back to who we really are. Well, I, you know, I like to believe that because that makes a lot more sense to me than just landing on planet Earth in this sea of craziness <laughs> and trying to figure it out, right? Right, because right. When I, when I look at a very young child, I see the perfection in them. I see their light. And, and as you said, so many of us, and, and I agree, I would say 90% of the, the world is believing they're unworthy too, and we pick up these messages and we absorb them, um, and then we decide that we're something other than who and what we are. So I remember yes. being a little kid and thinking, um, it was a thought I had that I chose to come here, and I was aware that I was coming to a planet that was dense, very dense and very difficult, and that I was oh. here to transform some way. And that's a pretty profound thought for a little kid. And I mean, I, I didn't really know Absolutely. what to do with it, but it was really a, an awareness that I had at a very young age. Yeah, that is profound. Very good. And I mean, that's where the, the juice is anyway, when we're young like that, we're, you know, we're so innocent and we're really, I think, one step on the other side and one step here. And then as time goes on, we lose that. So um, let's talk about when you talk of addictions, you talk about it being a brilliant strategy. Uh, and you came to a place where this strategy, the strategy didn't serve you any longer. Can you speak to that? Like, how did you feel? And the reason I'm asking is there are so many, and we, every family has people um, that are struggling. There are so many that never come to a point where they realize it doesn't serve them any longer. Well, I think that the reason I call addiction a brilliant strategy is it's so easy to look at what's wrong about it. And it's really Mm -hmm. easy to really marginalize people who we consider to be addicted. If we look at a broader definition of addiction, and the, the definition that I would use is repetitively looking for someone or something outside of myself to try to somehow it's the ways the pain that's happening within. And if we look at it that way, we can all of us say, well, I've definitely had at least some things that I would say I've been addicted to. The reason I call them a brilliant strategy, um, rather than either a coping mechanism or looking at addiction as the problem itself, is that, you know, in my experience, people that have addiction 
have a great deal of shame, which is what we were talking about. I believe I'm unworthy. I believe I'm broken. And so the drugs and alcohol or the, you know, whatever the, the addiction might be, and it could be, a, again, a very broad spectrum, does bring relief from that in the beginning for most people. And so if we look at it as wrong, we might get stuck there. But when we say, wow, in what ways was it brilliant, then we can start having a conversation with ourselves or with the person who is um, practicing an addiction is it still brilliant? Is it still getting you what you truly desire? And I think um, the marginalizing people and the stigmatizing people doesn't really help because a lot of times when we hear the word addiction, and I, many people have said, oh, you work in addiction, and they immediately go to the homeless situation or someone who's really down and out. And although that is one face of addiction, that is certainly mm-hmm. not the full um, experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm been guilty of that myself as far as um you know, not really looking at it from that perspective, just maybe frustrated that the person isn't helping themselves. And you can you can see you you can see some people are so creative and so gifted and their addictions may go on for forty forty five years or more. And and you, if if the, if the person is in the family, it's just frustrating. But I learned a lot of things by reading your book, so I thank you for that. Um, you can come from that place of love, but you can easily change that to judgment when you're in when you're in that space with them. And um, it's some work that I need to continue to work on. Yeah, because it is painful watching someone not seeming seemingly not be able to help themselves or get out of something that seems so destructive. And if it's someone we love, you know, then we have fear too. What if this person dies? What if they don't get through this? Um, I want to see them happy. And that can easily cross the line of judgment. And so I think the key is to honor what I'm feeling. If I'm talking about a loved one, you know, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel concerned for them. Um, What Mm -hmm. we want to look at is is the judgment actually helping or what would love do there, right? How can love be a part of this equation? And sometimes uh, the people we're closest to are the ones that are the most difficult to help. Sometimes we have to let someone else do that for us because um, especially with families, it's so easy to go into old roles and judgment. Right. Well said. And a good point. I think it is more challenging to try to help when you're that close, when you love the person. Um, So thank you for that. Um, So you talk about a spiritual disconnection, which I agree with. And when you think about it, when you're connected and you're in that space and you're living from that place, um, you know, everything, everything is doable. Everything, every problem or challenge can be looked at from, from that place. But um, when you speak of, talk about more about the spiritual disconnect, because what do you really mean in the book? Yeah, thank you. So I've identified the three root causes of addiction or addictive behaviors as unresolved trauma, spiritual disconnection, and toxic shame. And so Mm. spiritual disconnection to me is actually very simple. You know, we come into the world very connected with the truth of who and what we are. And then we, as we've already said, we start to become programmed by people consciously or unconsciously to believe that we're damaged or broken. So we separate from our essential beingness, if you will. Um, And for some people, that might sound a little esoteric. So we can think of spiritual uh, connection as being connected to our true self, our authentic self. Um, And then when we start picking up lies about ourselves, we do disconnect from that. And we start to believe that we are our past or our issues. We start to believe that we are our thoughts, but the truth of who we are is beyond all of that. So for me, part of the recovery process is returning to that essential place of wholeness um, and recognizing there's a place within each of us 
that is unharmed and unharmable. And that as a starting point I have seen have profound results because as we've already said, people feel so broken and it makes it in many ways difficult if they believe they're broken. It's kind of like why bother, right? What's the point? Right. So when we reconnect with our spiritual nature, we, get, we, we start to you know, look at things like passion, purpose, connection, love. Those are essentially spiritual um, experiences. Right. And it may necessarily not mean going to church because spirituality is, can be within ourselves in our own living room. Absolutely. Yes. I like to, I like to mention that because some, sometimes people think that you're may not be spiritually connected in the depth that they are because they're going to church and you are not. But that's a whole education thing. And I, and I think it goes back to judging that everyone should have the right to do whatever they choose. And you can have the most benevolent relationship with God, Jesus, whoever you'd like, um, right in your own home. So, um, and experience all those amazing, phenomenal things that each person receives or experiences when they, when they are open to all that. Yeah. Yeah. When when I work with someone and they're questioning what spirituality is, one thing that can be really helpful is to look at what we were taught spirituality is. So some people are taught that it's religion. Some people are taught that it's not. Some have a combination, yes. right? So to be able to see what the differences are, and of course for some people they want both, right? Their religion becomes important to them again, or maybe it remains important. But for other people, that's not their path. Their path might be a path of being more connected with themselves, building authentic community. Maybe they commune with nature, right? So there's a lot of different ways we can um, be or experience spirituality. Right. And there's a lot of commonalities, too, in the just different verbiage. But um, it's, all, it's all the source, whatever you want to call it, but it's the source. Um, yeah. And um, it's fascinating to, I find it fascinating to hear other people talk about different things, and they might be using different terms, but, it, but it's all the same, as long as it's coming from a place of love and, and not a, you need to do this or you need to do that. Um, at least that's from my perspective. <laughs> um, yeah, but let's no, talk. exactly. A lot of, a lot of time. You know, most, most spiritual teachers um, or even religious figures, they ultimately are saying this is about love, right? That's the thread that connects it all. The rest right. becomes thought, it becomes theology, it becomes concepts, and those can serve us, but they can also uh, separate us. So we want to look at what do I truly desire? Do I truly desire love and connection with myself and others? And what role would spirituality have? And that might or might not include religion. And does religion help me feel more connected or disconnected? In some cases, a little bit of both. So we get to walk through that for ourselves. And, you know, I think the thing for me is to honor all paths and remind myself mm -hmm. that my path is changed over time. So there's not only one right. path to spirit or source. Right. And and I think it's so powerful to to ask ourselves these kinds of questions because that's how you learn the truth of who you really are and what you desire and and not. And I think that's when a lot of the creativity can be developed by by asking yourself all um, every question that you can imagine. Um, Absolutely. I'm a question girl. Uh, so let's <laughs> get into toxic shame because I think that a lot, of, a lot of people will talk about forgiveness, but they may not really get into the toxic shame. And I, I believe that, again, just like the 90% not feeling worthy, that we can have toxic shame in all different types of, um, experiences and we may not give it justice to really look at it and what we're feeling about it. So please speak to that, TJ. Yeah, the reason I, I use the word toxic or add the word toxic to the shame is that shame really does become toxic in our system. So when we believe we're fundamentally flawed or broken, and of course, 
most of us by now have heard the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I think I've done something wrong. Shame is, I believe I am wrong, or there's something fundamentally wrong with me. And we work with those in two very, very different ways. So, you know, forgiveness would help with guilt. Um, asking for forgiveness, um, making amends would help with guilt. But shame is something altogether different. When we feel deeply flawed and we believe that who we are is fundamentally broken, we tend to act broken in the world, and then we feel more shame. So that becomes a downward spiral, if you will. I feel broken, I act broken, and say, see, I am broken, or the world is broken. And the way we interrupt that is by first becoming aware of it and aware that it's not the truth of who we are, that shame is a lie that we've picked up about ourselves, and that we can then start to look at when did we first start to believe these things. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'll never amount to anything. These are, this is the inner dialogue, but it's even more than inner dialogue. It's also an energy that we're carrying around. And that becomes what creates what we call reality because we're walking around vibrating with I'm not worthy. And we, unconsciously or sometimes consciously two situations to confirm that core false belief. Right. And we probably already all of us have seen that we actually can feed that feeling with looking for something to feed it, just as you say. Yes. Well, we, yes. we need to take our first break. Um, so everyone stay with us. Don't go away. Um, if you want to get in touch with TJ, it's TJ Wood Wood. It's W-O-O-D-W-A-R-D dot com. Uh, and you can get his books on his site and anywhere you purchase books. Uh, and we actually have TJ's book, Conscious Recovery, uh, as our book of the month. So you may be able to win one. But I'm always about reading and purchasing books as gifts so people can hold a book and really enjoy and learn. So we'll be back in a moment. Experience a different yet profound healing with Reconnective Healing. Includes yet expands beyond any and all known forms of energy healing. The Reconnective Healing Spectrum is comprised of the full healing and evolutionary continuum of energy, light, and information. It allows for healings that are not just physical, not just mental, not just emotional, yet go beyond that to bring healing that includes the evolution of your very being and essence. Deborah Beauvais, trained and certified by world-renowned Dr. Eric Pearl, offers appointment hours at Seacock Family Chiropractic in Seacock, Massachusetts. For questions or to set up both distance or local sessions, call Deborah at 508-431-1959. Again, 508-431-1959. Or go to lovebyintuition.com. That's lovebyintuition.com. Calling all authors. Have you been considering an audiobook? Well, look no further. Come take advantage of Dream Vision 7 Radio Network's unique in-house audiobook production, which includes benefits and bonuses from our radio station. Let our knowledgeable staff guide you to create the audiobook you've always dreamed of without breaking the bank. Check out our full one-stop service from A to Z, including the ACX process. Schedule a free consultation by calling 508-226-1723. That's 508-226-1723. Or go to dreamvision 7 radio.com After narrowly surviving the attack on Sandy Hook Elementary, first grade teacher Caitlin Royd Develis was left searching for answers that would never come. Eventually, she chose to focus on questions that could be answered. How do I make sure this tragedy doesn't define us? How do we get our control back? Those two questions led her to found the 501c3 nonprofit organization Classes for Classes. When gifts poured into their classroom, she decided they would help someone else by paying it forward and being kind. This developed into a social network which allows K-8 classrooms to connect so that every student in the United States can learn these crucial lessons. Classes for Classes' mission is to build students' social-emotional intelligence by connecting them to care. All C4C projects are crowdfunded. Any teacher in the U.S. can visit classesforclasses.org. That's classes, the number four, classes.org. Sign up today. 
Delight your kids with an enchanting journey by reading the Paper Doll Kids Children's Book by Deborah Bove and Janine Sullivan. There's even a catchy tune, Kids for Love Song, produced by Bob Sherwood and sung by kids just like yours. The story weaves around seven paper dolls flying around the world doing good deeds as they bring important attention to our endangered animal friends. There's even a magical ring with a universal message. Kids become interested in service projects, action through compassion, and planting seeds that nurture positive change. The Paper Doll Kids and Kids for Love Song are a production of the Kids for Love Project. Get the book now on Amazon Kindle and the song on CD Baby or iTunes. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. And we are back, and you you can still call in. Bob is here waiting and can connect you with the number 833-220-1200, 833-220-1200. You can ask TJ a question or share a thought. Um, So we welcome you. Okay, so TJ, uh, one of the things that I really liked that you delved into was non-resistance. So share what it means to practice or actually um, what is non-resistance for the listeners and how can we practice? Well, I think a lot of times when people hear non-resistance, they just say, oh, we're just going to let anything happen to us and we don't have any agency. And that's not really what non-resistance is to me. Non-resistance, I I use the analogy of a river. We imagine there's a, a, let's say it's a gentle river and you're in a boat and it's gently guiding you. This isn't about putting a motor in and trying to control or direct our lives. This is about letting the current take us, but we do get to steer, right? And that means we can be in the flow of life, using this as an analogy, we're using the flow of life, but we're steering and we steer by intention. We steer by a meditation practice, by connecting with our true nature. Um, Another way to talk about it is, you know, when we resist, what we resist persists. And I think we all know that now. We look at whole movements that are dedicated to fighting, and it just seems to create more of what it's trying to expel, if you will. So for some people, the idea of non-resistance can be really foreign, but what we're really doing is we're inviting people to look at what gets created when we're trying to control the world and what might happen if we can unplug from that and plug into our true nature and then start to ask how we can be, have agency for our own life without trying to control the situations and the people around us. Right, because that's a big, that's a big ticket item. In essence, I mean, it's so simple and yet it's challenging that if we do work on ourselves and go within, we can change that vibration. We can change the collective consciousness, as I always say, um, by feeding it the love and what we do with ourselves because in essence, we have to ask, you know, are we holding anger? Do we have hatred? And when you start asking questions like that and being truthful, you can see and find this, this some of that within each of us. And another thing that I find fascinating or entertaining at times is when you have a conversation. Uh, there are times when you, something comes out of your mouth and you're like thinking to yourself, well, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> when you become so aware. Um, so I'm sure that you, you're you aware of everything that you say as well, and sometimes um, it, brings, uh, it brings something that needs to be addressed or tweaked. Have right. you experienced and, and, that? Yeah, and I love that you're ta- the way you're talking about it because it really is very rich. Um, one thing that I've dedicated myself to doing is to moving beyond the idea of good and bad and right and wrong and look mm-hmm. at what gets in, right? Look at the energy I'm bringing. And so words have power, but they're really delivering some kind of energy, right? So if I am mm-hmm. saying I'm fighting 
something, I'm against something. I mean, we look at certain political figures who everyone got so angry and outraged and just he soared to power, right? We've seen that throughout history because there's something fundamentally different in really being aware of what energy and what frequency I'm bringing to this situation. And not from a place, because it's easy to go into self-criticism. I certainly did mm-hmm. for a long time. Well, I shouldn't mm-hmm. think that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be fighting. So we want to look at, rather than that, we want to start looking at that, again, as a brilliant strategy. Maybe anger kept me feeling safe at one point. But now I'm realizing that the true change that happens, the way we actually do affect collective consciousness, is by doing our own healing and then bringing that to the world. That's very different than trying to get the world to change so we can be happy. Right, because it's overwhelming. Uh, and, And some people are living in that. They're fearful for what's going to happen next. And their life is going by. You know, they're not enjoying the, you know, the beauty of what's around them because they're so in fear of something happening to them. And you can understand it, but you can't live in that space. You can't live in that energy um, and thrive, put it that way, in your own life. So, right. If we can get back to judgment, how do, you know, what are some of the things that you taught yourself as far as ending judgment because it's it's a common it's a common thing with most everyone you can be conscious of it and then you can you know like you're talking right or wrong um and then you can catch yourself well is this really a judgment or isn't it and and it can kind of drive you into a frenzy if you're how do you how do you stop it? Is it through meditation? Is it through, uh, how, how do you do it? And I know it's a process. Well, I think, yeah, it's a process, and it can happen in an instant, right? I can become aware in an instant the energy that gets created when I have a judgment. And, you know, sometimes, I guess I want to start by saying, you know, judgment gets a bad rap, right? We have a negative connotation of the word. The truth is my mind is always judging. This is pleasant. This is unpleasant. This is good. This is bad. She's very nice. I don't like her. Like, the mind is constantly doing it. And um, at one point, I thought the intention was to stop that, right? And that showed up in my meditation practice where I thought the intention was to quiet the mind. And... I realized sometimes it just was brutal. And having a different relationship with that is fundamental to me. So rather than thinking I shouldn't have judgment or I shouldn't have thoughts while I'm meditating, uh, I should be more loving, right? We, we hear mm-hmm. these kind of thoughts. Um, we can say something like, what gets created when I do this? You talked about something earlier in the show that is so important to me, and that is living in the question. Being aware of the questions that we can ask that will open us up. So if I notice myself having some kind of judgment and I can feel the energy is very restrictive because the truth is judgment restricts and curiosity expands, right? So I do, want, do I want a more expansive life? So I ask questions like, where did I get that idea? How do I know this is true about what I'm perceiving? What else is possible here? What does it feel like when I have this judgment? And then even more importantly, what would it be like for me to be free of this? And just to live Mm. in some of these questions, start to realize that we do have the ability to shift the way we perceive life. Mm, I like that. Um, How how would I feel? Yeah, that is, that's powerful. It's yeah, because that's stuff. really the key. The key is the frequency. It's what would it be like? What would I experience? What would I feel or think? Or what would it really? What would it be like? What would the experience mm. be like if you were to be free of this judgment? Right, and that can change in a second. With you can change that moment and then look around, and the whole energy field is totally different. And you can feel it. It's tangible. So that that's Absolutely. really good. Yeah. So how does it come, you know, all this that we're talking about, 
how does it come around when you're having a relationship with someone and say that you're doing all the inner work and they may not be on board doing theirs? Do you see that relationship yeah. thriving? Well, I think there are layers, right? There are layers to that because I would start with um, questioning if that's true because that might be a judgment I have. And then I ask myself, okay. might, that, might that be a projection, right? That's where I always start because I discovered something, and this is so simple, and yet it took me a long time to understand that this is true. I am projecting. I am holding mm-hmm. the projector and projecting onto people and situations. So I might have a judgment like they're not doing their inner work, um, mm-hmm. and I might want to pause say, oh, I wonder in what way I'm not doing mine, or is there a way I can do more of my own healing? And that is not to say that in some cases certain relationships shift and change. Sometimes we heal together and sometimes we heal apart, right, or we grow apart. And Mm -hmm. that is also part of what I talk about in conscious recovery along with non-resistance, and that is the, the... impermanence, the impermanence of maybe this relationship is supposed to change forms. And sometimes it's in the holding tightly to it that we miss the possibility, right? We sometimes hold on to an idea of how a relationship is supposed to look, and it might not be true. Right. Good point. So then then it's almost stepping back and just letting it be and coming from that place of love so that you can weave together in some fashion. Yeah, Yeah. and sometimes what I've seen in in my own journey and and a lot of people I know and certainly clients I've worked with, as we grow and evolve, sometimes people leave our lives, and that's a wonderful sign that we're growing. It doesn't mean it's Mm -hmm. wonderful that a relationship ends, but it also doesn't mean it's not, right? Because I think sometimes we have these ideas of, this relationship should last forever. This friendship should last forever. And, you know, sometimes we come together for a reason or a season or a lifetime. And being able to wear that more loosely, I think, will give us more freedom. And I think that's where the paradox comes in. And then I'm not holding on so tightly. And maybe through that, we can actually have a deeper connection. Right. And that, that's what I like is getting to a place where it's deeper together. That, that sounds so good to me. Um, <laughs> and so, okay, so we, um, we're coming up on a break. Uh, what I would like to ask you, and we can start for a couple of minutes and then come back with more, is how do you see the world today? from your perspective? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? I know. Um, I think think I'm going to answer it first in kind of an esoteric way, and that is I see the world today the way I see the world today, right? So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, the world is – there are so many different experiences happening on planet Earth, and at any moment I can focus on one and call it reality. And so we could say the world is brutal and hostile, and we can find evidence to support it. We can say the world is kind and loving, and we can find evidence to support that. In my experience, the world is evolving. We are elevating our consciousness, and yet we still have things that look like it's outside of love. So it's a, it's a very multi-layered conversation. I don't think there's one answer for it. I, I will say that, um, you know, we, of course, so many of us are talking about with social media the way it is. It does create more connection in a lot of ways, but in some ways mm. it creates disconnect as well because it, some platforms are just a platform for judgment, right, which is creating the other. It's creating different camps. It's, you know, people coming together to be against someone or something. And this has been going on throughout time. Uh, That's the human ego. But these devices Mm -hmm. we have do make it readily available. So I can understand why people would say, um, the world. you know, people will say the world is more difficult than it's ever been. But I I don't think that's true. I think that's a point of view. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well, we're going to take our break. We'll be back and 
um, we'll we'll share a little more about this topic um, because it all really feeds into going within um, and finding your truth. So we'll be back. The number we'll put out is, you have to hurry, but there's still some time, 833-2, excuse me, 833-220-1200. Take a journey to a place of the divine love within with Deborah Beauvais on the Love by Intuition show, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Eastern. Our message is love in the purest form. The light within us all is a guide to recall our beginning, to learn to love self and humankind, and to feel the higher power of our own divinity. To attract love, one needs to be love. Come join us and step into this glorious vibration called love. Delight your kids with an enchanting journey by reading the Paper Doll Kids Children's Book by Deborah Beauvais and Janine Sullivan. There's even a catchy tune, Kids for Love Song, produced by Bob Sherwood and sung by kids just like yours. The story weaves around seven paper dolls flying around the world doing good deeds as they bring important attention to our endangered animal friends. There's even a magical ring with a universal message. Kids become interested in service projects, action through compassion, and planting seeds that nurture positive change. The Paper Doll Kids and Kids for Love Song are a production of the Kids for Love Project. Get the book now on Amazon Kindle and the song on Feedy Baby or iTunes. Are miracles real? Can you move from mayhem to miracles? 30 prominent authors say yes as they share their high fives and down lows of challenges, abuse, addiction, and love. Experience hope, the magic elixir of miracles, through the personal stories of New York Times best-selling authors James Redfield, Dr. Bernie Siegel, Sister Jenna, Reverend Temple Hayes, and many more. If you like bestsellers, chaos to clarity, and crappy to happy, you'll love crying and laughing through Mayhem to Miracles, sacred stories of transformational hope, available now on Amazon and in bookstores worldwide. It's a child's job to play, to learn, and to have fun. It's an adult's job to keep them safe. Did you know that one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused before the age of 18? Every day, families enter the Children's Advocacy Center because a child's courage to tell someone what happened to them. Keeping our children safe starts with a conversation. This is Michelle Aranger, Executive Director of the Children's Advocacy Center. Learn more on how to keep your child safe. Visit CACofBC.org. This message made possible by the Fall River Rotary Club. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. And we are back. We're talking with T.J. Woodward, and it's the book, the latest book he has is Conscious Recovery, A Fresh Perspective on Addiction. I think it's so important for everyone listening to share the show, order the book. Um, It's packed with solid information that you can implement in your everyday life. And, And then it's a gift a gift of reading and learning to whoever you purchase it for. So get yourself a couple of copies of Conscious Recovery, A Fresh Perspective on Addiction. So did you want to want to elaborate at all or add on to what you were sharing before the break, TJ? Well, I think the important question that we can ask ourselves, and I know this is true for you because I hear it in your language and I know your work, and that is, how can we be the love in the world that the world, is, that the world requires, right? And, you know, master teachers have been saying this for centuries, be the love, right? Be that love frequency. And I think it's so seductive to look at what's broken in the world and think we need to fix it. And as we've discussed, that, that I think tends to create more of what looks broken. I did a, a talk some years back called Consciousness is an Algorithm, And so an algorithm uh, on social media, for example, is very simple. What we click on, they give us more of. Whether we click love or whether we click thumbs down, whatever we focus on, the algorithm gives us more of that. 
So if we're shopping for blue shoes, we'll see them all over our news feed, right, somehow. And so that is a very simple demonstration of what we focus on grows. So if I'm focusing on the brokenness of the world, I'm going to see more of it. Here's where it's nuanced, because I think some people interpret that as let's pretend like there's nothing that looks bad happening in the world. Let's pretend mm -hmm. that abuse doesn't happen. Let's look the other way. Not at all. What we're saying is in the midst of that, because we've done enough of our own healing, we can actually be the love and bring the love to that situation. We're not fighting the situation. We're actually bringing something to it. And I think that that can be nuanced for people, and it can sound like semantics, but it's actually profound because it's a completely different way of viewing the world and being in the world. Right. That, that, that's, that's good. It's viewing or being one or the other or both at times um, right. and then right. checking, on, checking on yourself. Yes. And it, it's fascinating. I use that word a lot. Um, because no matter what is created, there's always someone that, there's, there's always, well, I should because then I'm now I'm putting people into a, and I'm, and I'm judging, but isn't, it's too, it's a shame, we'll put that. It's a shame that some people will um, take something that's good and turn it all around, like you're saying on social media. And I, I just say at times, please let them connect with their, with their light, with their soul, with their, just put their hand over their heart so they can connect with that and then pull that energy from the heaviness or the darkness. And, and I think it's good to embrace darkness. I think that's important. Yeah. But not in the sense where you're living it like that, but pull it from there and put it in the, you know, in the glow, in the nature, in the love, all the, all the goodness. And then maybe, just maybe, they will stop and think before they act. And um, I just trust that there will be more of that as we go along. And I'd love to see more of that in my lifetime. Absolutely. And, and we are seeing more and more of that. And yet at the same time, I think we, we tend to build coalitions of people around our beliefs. And I think what we're talking about is something much deeper than that. And it's a very different way mm -hmm. of seeing. And, and that is connecting through love and as love and realizing that I'm not my opinions. So I don't have to have everyone in my sphere of influence or my friends all agree with me. And then I'm not at right. war with, right? And we can then actually bring light to the darkness of the world rather than adding to it because that's the part that's seductive, right? And, and, and the news stations know that. They know how to, like, you know, put the flashing lights and the breaking news and, you know, what we call news on, you know, major news networks or social media is just a tiny little piece of what's actually happening on the planet. But we have collectively right. decided that that's what news is. Right. But I believe that will change, too. You know, a lot of big pharma, all these things will fall by the wayside because it does not serve the whole. And it's, it's just going to crumble. I, we'll see how long that takes. But there's a lot of new adventures, a lot of new developments that are pulling people together for a good cause. And there's, I mean, and we should say that for hundreds and thousands of years, there have been people that have made huge difference, um, you know, yeah. on the earth before they have left. Uh, and, and that's, what I think, what keeps the, everything propelling to go forward and evolve little by little. Uh, so, um, well, that's right. I, could, oh, it's, I could go. It's really our turn, right? And I think that's the key. Um, it's no longer, we're at a time now where we're not looking for the next master. We are the next master. Each of us can bring love into the world, right? It's no longer about one person or one teacher. We look throughout history at these beautiful beings, and now it's multiplied by tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, and that's how consciousness shifts, 
more and more yes. of us dedicated to, you know, we do embrace our own darkness. We do heal that so that we can be the love in the world. And then that then starts to actually create the ripple of change that we're seeing. That's right. That is correct. That feels so good when you say that. So at, towards, at the end of your book, you talk about awakened living, which is kind of on the realm of what we're speaking of. And I'm also going to say, is there anything that you want to share for the listeners that you haven't already? Is there a speaking engagement? Is whatever you would like to share, TJ? Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I love that you asked about awakened living because that really is the culmination of, of the spiritual experience is that we get to live an awakened life. And so what does that mean? Because we hear the term woke, the term, we hear, hear the term awakened. To me, it's so simple. It's awakening to the truth of who and what we are that is beyond the concepts and ideology. It's beyond the core false beliefs. It's not the shame or our trauma or our disconnection. It's that each of us came into the world as a whole and perfect spiritual being, and that is available at every moment to remember that, to return to that awareness that that's who and what we are. And we're moving out of the era of the law of attraction and into the era of law of radiance. We're here to know who we are and be that in the world. And as more and more of us do that, that becomes magnified on planet Earth. That really is the essence of awakened living, living beyond the, the constructs of our, of our thought, living beyond the ideologies that we've collectively created, living beyond the core false beliefs that we have about ourselves in the world, and realizing that love is the greatest power in the universe. That's really all I, that, that's all I know to say at this moment, because that's the simple truth. Beautiful. And now, would you like to share anything else? Well, I, th I would invite people to go to my Instagram. It's tjwoodward underscore. Um, and there I post quotes. I post, like, the shows that I'm on, speaking events that are coming up. I'm, I, I'm about, I just got confirmation I'm speaking at a conference in London in September. Um, Conscious Recovery, my, my movement, we have a conference every year in Orange County, California in September. So if you go there or go to tjwoodward.com, you can keep up with me. Sometimes I can't keep up with me, but, you know, <laughs> I'm on a mission. <laughs> and what is your – I know you're on your mission, but what is your next step or what has been bubbling up for you uh, that is coming up for you that, or you're maybe on the – just on the edge of something new? I think the edge, the edge of something new um, in the people that I'm working with and talking with, it, it really is ushering in this new level of consciousness where we're moving beyond our tribal identity. And what I mean by that is like the different groups that we identify with and that that was a survival earlier in the evolution of, of humankind. And now we're moving into... I think the most exciting thing for me is we're moving, you know, we often hear we're spiritual beings having a human experience, and I see us on the precipice of spiritual beings having a spiritual experience, and that we really are here to be that frequency, and that's what, that's what I'm up to in any, any different way that um, wherever the yes is for that, I love working with people who have an addiction because that's a moment for many people where they surrender and they say, there's got to be a better way. So that's one of the groups. That, that's why I love working with that group. But to me, we're on this beautiful um, evolution and expansion that's happening right now. Right now. Mm. And there's always hope, correct? Always hope for those that may have been doing their addiction for decades. There's always that hope. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, all right. Well, I want to thank you. It's been such a joy to have you, and I'm sure we'll have you back another time. Uh, and I would love for, that. Thank you, TJ. We've had a, a good conversation. <laughs> Do you have another book coming out? 
No, my, Conscious Creation came out a year ago, and I have said to myself I'm complete now with that trilogy, so we'll okay. see. There might be an autobiography at some point, but not, it, it's not any time in the near future, that's for sure, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. All right. So for those listening, um, share the show and buy the book, Conscious Recovery, A Fresh Perspective on Addiction. And you can go on our site, if you go on the Love by Intuition page, uh, all of the social media links for TJ uh, right there. Uh, and again, uh, pass it on and listen to it again. So I thank you again and um have a beautiful, glorious continuation of all the work that you do, TJ, out there on the West Coast, that we can feel the vibration over here in the Boston area. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right. And to everyone, until we meet again and we come together in love, au revoir. Are you seeking a clearer path to love? Then tune in to the Love by Intuition show next week. All designed to your highest good. To contact Deborah Buffet, owner of Empowered Connections, call her at 508-226-1723. That's 508-226-1723. Or link on to lovebyintuition.com. Remember... We are all one, and we are all part of the miracle of love. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax and enjoy. Let life flow.